today we have five more than five thousand in the in the meetup group, so it's uh, uh, it's really nice. Uh, thanks to all of you, uh, and to, and uh, we are sponsored uh, this time by uh, Samsung, uh, and provide us with this uh, wonderful uh, place. Thanks a lot. Um, and we had the chance to have great speakers tonight, so I hope you'll enjoy it. And um, you'll feel free to, uh, to discuss with them and, and with me afterwards. And, uh, I will leave the, the mic to, uh, uh, to Gilles, uh, just to one little word uh, before that. Uh, so this meetup is organized by uh, Euritech, the company uh, uh, I founded. And Euritech, uh, Alex will be uh, talking a bit more about, about it, so I don't have to present uh, what it is. Uh, so uh, some of the speech, the speeches will be, I think, most of them in English or I or in French. It depends on the on the speakers usually, but um, we'll see. About that. Here, you want to say a word? Hello. Uh, first of all, we are really very happy to have you all here. Uh, so we're part of Samsung. Uh, we are working here in this uh, beautiful building. Uh, and uh, we are part of uh, the Samsung Strategy and Innovation Center, uh, which is uh, an entity of Samsung uh, that is uh, uh, here to promote uh, innovation and around uh, Samsung, of course. Uh, and uh, we have three main activities. <coughs> the first one is uh, investment. Uh, we have a, a Samsung Catalyst, which is a multi-stage VC <coughs> fund. So if you are interested, you can come uh, to see me and see Nicola, uh, that is here tonight. Uh, and uh, a corporate uh, development activity with Roberto, which is there uh, with us, and uh, that promote partnership around innovation with startup and, and uh, companies. Uh, and uh, myself, for the R&D part, we have an AI lab here uh, in Paris. Uh, for R&D, uh, we are doing deep learning, machine learning, AI in general, so robotics, uh, natural language processing, and stuff like that. We have uh, something like 30 engineers, and we're still hiring, so if you're interested, yeah, you can come and see me, and talk with a few people of the lab that are uh, there tonight, so please uh, come and see us, uh, and I will let the stage to the speakers. Thanks. Yes, Alex, first. Thank you very much. So, uh, hi everybody, I'm Alexandre, a research scientist at Eritech uh, since 2016. Uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about our research in uh, deep learning at Eritech, uh, the ongoing project, which has been uh, published on uh, archive, so get a glimpse on it, and, and is currently under submission. Uh, our paper called Omnia Faster CNN tackled the wide subject of object detection in the wild. It's a compulsory step for what we do at Eritech, but also for many of our applications, such as autonomous driving, for example. So uh, my point will be in 3D. <laughs> the first D is for detection for fashion. Second D is for data set merging. And the third D, which is a little bit far-fetched, is driving autonomously. So in order to understand why we develop such a technology, uh, you need to understand what we do at Eritech. Eritech initial goal according to Tony Panville, the founder of Eritech, it was to analyze internet. So it's a big challenge, and currently we're just focusing on fashion trends. This is way enough. <laughs> so uh, we aim at bridging the gap between machine learning and uh, luxury, and everything is going fine, so join the fun. Yeah. Uh, ins our intuition is that images could give relevant insight about customers and trends in general. Millions of images are published every day on social networks <coughs> such as uh, Instagram. And we are not doing targeting. We only are doing trend detection in order to help the brand to create new products and everything. We would like to analyze images as we do a fashionista, but at scale. So our vision team has built an image pipeline in order to analyze millions of images a day it's a two-step pipeline. The first step is about detection. So in this, for this woman who would like to detect from top to bottom, uh, coat, the top, uh, eyeglasses, a <laughs> bag, and everything, but this is not enough. And that's why there is another step. The another step is a classification that try to detect the, the type of uh, bag, 
we add qubits, and when possible, we brand and the back model. So this is a luggage by Selin. Yeah, we all become experts in back models. Like, yeah, we know <laughs> thousands of back models you can't imagine. So let's begin the technical part. Uh, object detection has been a wide subject of uh, research, and many approaches have been proposed for fast and accurate detection. One of the state of the art uh, module is the Saster SNN. For those who don't know the uh, network, you just need to understand that this is a two step architecture. So, the first step is about uh, detecting interesting regions in the image by the region proposal network. And these interesting regions are given to final classifier that try to, uh, to classify into categories and background. So there is a background class that encapsulates everything that has not been tagged and background stuff, such as roads, sky. <coughs> uh, for training, uh, you need huge uh, data set in order to learn visual representation. And for detection, the data set are very hard to get, very expensive and time consuming because you need fully supervised data set with all items of all objects in all images untated. Missing and noisy annotation could lead to very bad results. And this is very important to, to understand for the future of the presentation. Because <coughs> in the images of the cars, you can't have any car missing. Otherwise, the, uh, the result would be very bad. And the, uh, so as the dataset are pretty uh, complicated to have, uh, and the dataset are pretty small compared to those for other tasks, such as classification, for example. So the, uh, eBay released in 2018 a uh, dataset called Modelnet, uh, which has uh, 50K images with uh, 13 gamuts, such as uh, footwear, top, coat, and everything. And when you train a fashion detector on it, it gives a really perfect result for fashion uh, with one only one person posing in good, good image quality and everything. And this is the reason why FasterSN <coughs> is so widely used in academia and in industry. I'm pretty sure uh, some of you are using this FasterSN architecture in your company. But what is uh, really not often told is that it often fails. Today I'm going to show you what happens when you push such a network in production. On Instagram, you don't always have uh, fashion, uh, fashion images. Sometimes you've got random stuff like this bottle of wine. So the question uh, I always ask to my friend at night is what does the detector see? What does the fashion detector see? And surprisingly, he always thinks this is a dress with a skirt at the bottom. So it's a huge failure. What about this uh, fire element? So, uh, similarly, it will think that this is a dress with a uh, headwear at the top. <laughs> so, I think uh, you begin to understand in which trouble we are because Instagram is not only for fashion images, we've got all kinds of images, so we're in open domain uh, detection. And moreover, Sometimes you've got categories you have never seen during the training. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, uh, so in machine learning, we most of the time suppose that the categories in training are the same as in interest testing. This is not the case here. So we are in open set detection. <coughs> the only reason why we know it's not a dress, this bottle of wine, is because we know it's something totally different. This is a bottle of wine. Because we have been taught since our birth to identify an incredible amount of items and uh, uh, whereas <coughs> this fashion detector only knows 13 fashion garments, sorry, only knows 13 things, whereas um, we know millions of different items. So last example for fun, this dog, if, uh, so the detector thinks it has a, a footwear, uh, whereas we know that dogs don't wear footwear, unless uh, most of the time, because you can't imagine what you can <laughs> see on, uh, on Instagram. So one first solution to improve the result would be to tag much more data from Instagram, <coughs> many images. That would be time consuming and pretty expensive. What is done <coughs> most of the time is to use open source data set in, uh, to get a better understanding of the world. This is what we call transfer learning for classification. Basically, you train your network on a huge data set 
such as ImageNet, and then you fine tune your network on the task at end. There is the equivalent of ImageNet for detection, is called co uh, COCO, for common objects in context. It has thousands of images with 80 uh, common objects, such as tennis racket. And thanks to your weather. Uh, so we would like to do the same stuff. We would like to train something on, on Coco and then transfer a feature on Modernet. The reason I'm here today is because it doesn't work at all. Like we can't do anything about it. It is not working. So nobody does, uh, nobody does anything about it, and it's not working. So we challenge the status quo, and we wanted to take a step back from the classical transfer learning and uh, view the problem through the angle of dataset merging. So the idea would be to, to learn a huge detector that learn to detect everything at the same time. It would be on different datasets and with different kinds of categories. So, so it would be the same detector for common object and for a fashion object. So, but there is a huge uh, problem, is that, as I told before, you can't learn a detector with missing annotation. The Coco images have been tagged for only for common object and not for fashion item. So we don't have the boxes for uh, tops on the image from, from the left. Similarly, for the image from Modernet on the right, you don't have boxes for tennis racket or human. So. If you want to train uh, that detector on the concatenation of a naive concatenation of a two dataset, it won't work at all. And currently, the only solution would be to tag manually every data, so every images from Coco with fashion garments, and every images from Modernet with uh, with uh, with tennis racket and human. So we would like to to replace this expensive abiding step with self training. So self-training is a strategy in which a model's prediction is used to train itself iteratively. It may replace uh, an a missing annotation by weak supervision of prediction. So if there is one slide you need to remember today, this is the one. So it describes the procedure you will use to train uh, our Omnia Faster Arsenal. The idea is to train two detectors differently at the beginning. The first step, you train one Coco detector and one fashion detector. Then you use your fashion detector to predict on Coco images, and you use your Coco detector to train on modelet images. So we will predict uh, a tennis racket on images from uh, Coco uh, from Modelet and top on images from Coco. At the end, you just concatenate everything, and you train a final detector on the full dataset. So images would be uh, uh, annotated with human-made annotation and with uh, weak supervision uh, by by previous detector. So this is the ID, and what is complicated is that you need accurate detectors of initial step because you will rely on these detectors to train to enrich the training dataset. As said, incorrect prediction can definitely curve the, the training dataset because you will train the detector on prediction and on human-made uh, detection. OK, so in order to make the first detector as good as possible, because just in order, uh, on when you train your final detector, you train with uh, fashion annotation and with prediction of common object. So for example, the image on the left, when you train your final detector, you will train with, uh, with annotation of tops and with prediction, for example, of uh, tennis rackets. So the first, uh, we want to make a uh, detector as good as possible. Uh, the ID, the problem is that, as you can see, Images from the net are very different from images from Coco in terms of illumination, of viewpoint, of image quality. There uh, you have got a mm, uh, lot of differences between the two. This is what we call 
a domain shift, and it will definitely decrease the performance. So we need to make our detector domain independent. So uh, domain adaptation is a huge thing in computer vision, but I won't have time to explain fully today, but I will try to, to just show one uh, useful and very uh, used approach, which name is gradient traversal <coughs> layer. So basically what you got is a, classi a conventional uh, classifier. There is a blue classifier that tries to predict labels uh, by using features from a uh, conventional neural net. Uh, the task is domain adaptation. So you've got one source data set, uh, which could be ModelNet, for example, with uh, labels which is supervised, and you've got one target data set, which is Coco, but this data set Coco is unsupervised. So you don't have any information about the labels in this, uh, for this data set. The goal of domain adaptation is to be as good as possible on the image of the target data set of Coco. The basic uh, method would be to, to just train on images from the net, but it won't work very well because the features extracted by the uh, convolutional neural net will be uh, clustered uh, according to the domain. So images from the net would be uh, different from, uh, far from the images from Coco. And definitely, even though the, uh, the network would work on images from the net, it would not necessarily work well for images from Coco. What you don't have labels for images from uh, Coco, but still, you've got some information. You've got, you know that these images exist. It's, it's an, an information that you may use for improving the result. The idea is to add a new domain classifier. This classifier will, will try to detect whether or not the image comes from Coco or Monolet. This is a very basic task. Like it's uh, really easy to tell whether the uh, where does the image come from. Uh, even uh, even more <coughs> when the features are so uh, clustered in two different areas. But a comes the magical uh, <coughs> uh, gradient traversal layer. This is just a layer that you plug between the features extractor and the domain classifier. This gradient classifier, you can see, add a minus lambda before the uh, before the backmap before the gradient, because it will basically reverse the gradient during the backpropagation. So then we will have an uh, an adversarial training, meaning that the domain classifier will do whatever it can to decrease the domain classification loss, whereas the feature extractor will do whatever it can to increase the domain classification loss. So the feature extractor will do everything it can to fool the uh, domain classifier, and uh, the features won't uh, contain any information about the uh, domain where the image comes from. At the end, once you have adapted your classifier, the, you can see that uh, the features extracted by the uh, network are pretty mixed up, like coll collapsing, and you don't have any more the two clusters. And by aligning this feature, you will have better results for your, uh, for, for your initial label predictor, and it uh, increases generalization to a new <coughs> domain. So it was uh, domain adaptation for classification, but our goal is to have uh, domain adaptation for detection. Um, domain adaptation has been only been studied recently for problem beyond classification, and the uh, current state of the art was domain adaptive faster SNN. Uh, the goal is just, you've got your basic architecture, and you just plug three new losses in order to domain adapt the detector. The first loss is a domain, is an image level domain adaptation loss. The second layer is on the instances uh, extracted by the region proposal network. And the third loss is a consistency <coughs> regularizi regularization. So basically, what you need to, to know is that we plug the, uh, instead of using the basic faster SNN, we use the domain adaptive faster SNN, and it gives significantly better results for domain adaptation. So when we train a detector on MonoNet, it will be way better at predicting stuff on Cocoa images. <coughs> so 
we domain adapt our detector, though we still have some wrong prediction. And we, uh, we would, like, would like to wisely select the images that, uh, and the prediction that we integrate in, your, in our training dataset. This will be done by, uh, by, by selecting only confident uh, prediction. Because we like to, 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 to separate and to treat differently prediction that have high confidence, <coughs> having high score, and this prediction will be considered as ground truth, as if they were made, uh, as if they were human made. On the other side, we would have unsafe prediction that are low confidence. So you can see that uh, the, the human box on <coughs> the blue numbers is a safe prediction, as it is pretty sure that this is a human. But on the top, you can see that the thing that looks like a tennis racket, it's an, an unsafe prediction, because we're not sure whether it's not, it's a, it's, it's a tennis racket. During the box classification optimization, we, l we like to align predicted probabilities with targets. So for the example, for, for the left, for this region, <coughs> we would like the score of the top to get as high as possible. For this safe prediction, we would like the score of uh, human to get as high as possible, and the other scale to get low. What about this region? So we don't know whether it's a tennis rocket or whether it's a background. So let's keep it simple and just uh, fix uh, the loss and don't do anything about it. But we know for sure this is not a top because this image comes from Modernet, and we know for sure that all tops have been tagged. So let's decrease this curve of top, and the same similarly for human. And so that's why we introduced a new classification loss, wh uh, which name is SoftC, because it combines softmax and sigmoid activation function while handling soft signs. This is basically the sum of a categorical uh, cross-entropy and a binary cross-entropy. The categorical cross-entropy is the de facto classification loss where all categories compete against each other. And the binary cross-entropy treats all categories as if they were binary uh, classifiers. An uh, independent uh, binary display. <laughs> so we just plug this loss uh, uh, rather than using the basic, uh, uh, basic uh, classific classification loss. And it helps using all the available information because we can handle unsafe prediction wisely. So now we used to predict a dress and a skirt. So now we're predicting good stuff like a wine glass, a bowl, a bottle, a potted plant. When we had a dress and an headwear, we now predicting a fire hydrant, and the dog is not a dog. Good. So by widening the scope of our detector, we managed to delay a lot of missing um, prediction, a uh, lot of bad prediction, and uh, we got a pretty good result uh, qualitatively. For example, uh, we've got a dashboard on which we've got all the prediction of our detector. And if you want to see fire hydrant with at, this is now the kind of image that you get. So. Okay. But uh, this was qualitati qualitative. Now we would like to have some quantitative analysis of our performance. We use the open image dataset, which is a huge <laughs> dataset with very different kind of images. Uh, which are uh, weakly annotated. And so uh, compared to the, ba to the basic modernet, uh, the basic training of modernet, our procedure enables to have a gain of almost uh, 50%. So it's a, a huge gain. Uh, so from 20.7 to 36.5. So it's a, a huge, huge gain. So we're, we're pretty happy about it. And we've got some ablation study showing the the interest of uh, different losses of distillation procedure and everything. Okay, so now the fashion is done. <coughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, you so we will skip the video, but uh, it, uh, you would have seen uh, nice, uh, like uh, you could have seen the uh, prediction of a uh, car, de uh, car detector. And it works pretty well, so like, because autonomous driving is a huge thing currently, 
you've got many, uh, many, many people working on it, like uh, Google, Valeo, Tesla, and everything. <laughs> and it, you, you can have, uh, there's a huge race about getting as much data as possible. One of, <laughs> one of those data sets is uh, Cityscape, which has a few thousand images, which are annotated for eight categories, such as uh, bicycle, you b bus, human, and car. Our question is, what if, if we, can, we could have removed the car instances <coughs> from being annotated? Because uh, uh, annota annotating cars is pretty time consuming. This was the ID of the dataset called Sim10K, uh, which was automatically annotated uh, from the video game uh, GTA. And the cars, there are thousands of uh, images with car annotation automatically made. There is a huge domain shift between these images and the, <coughs> and the real life images from the dataset Cityscape. A goal would be <coughs> to use the images from, uh, from, 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 from Simpson K in order to replace a new labeling step of cars into Cityscape. We like to apply a dataset merging procedure between these two datasets. And because, uh, in fact, adding a new entity inside the Cityscape is just a special case of a dataset merging procedure where uh, the Sin10K dataset only has, only has one category of annotated. <coughs> and basically, we would like to compare ourselves with a result that you could have uh, with full supervision. And uh, so basically, uh, annotating uh, a cast from the Cityscape is useless. You don't have to do this because you can only use annotation from uh, K. So, uh, last uh, experiment, uh, in order to compare ourselves with previous state of the art, because as we are the first one to, uh, to challenge the test merging, we can't uh, compare ourselves with previous one. <coughs> this challenge, which is domain adaptation that I quickly introduced before, uh, is uh, w w w widely studied by other people. And the goal is to uh, domain adapt the detector. So you've got a data set uh, source, which is a Sin10K, from, from, uh, from wood, which is supervised. Like you've got car annotation, and there is a target data set, which is Cityscape, case, which is totally unsupervised. The goal is to be as good as possible to predict uh, cars on the uh, target data set. And by, by, by using the images from the unsupervised Cityscape, <coughs> uh, once again, domain adaptation is just a special case of dataset merging when one of the two datasets is empty. And finally, so we, we, we beat the state of the art by using soft distillation from uh, 39.6 to 44.9, uh, only by using soft distillation as a way to domain adapt uh, the, uh, the detector. You could see uh, all the uh, results on the with a huge table uh, in the paper. So uh, in conclusion, uh, what is nice too is that this theoretical analysis main, uh, is in production at Aerotech. So at Aerotech, we've got one huge detector that detects everything in the same time. It enables to, to gain inference time because you don't have four detectors but only one, and it <coughs> improves the generalization. Once and one more, when you want to add one new category, you don't have to label everything, you just have to label the sub part of it, and it will automatically integrate this in the training. And in conclusion, I would say that I'm very happy to be here today, and I hope that uh, soon well, some of your startup will use uh, faster CNN and Omnia faster CNN for the application for your images in the wild. Thank you. Good to be here tonight. Um, <coughs> so it's a nice evening because uh, we're all talking about transfer learning. And actually, this is very interesting for you because you get the computer vision side, and now you will have the uh, NLP side. So if somebody do, maybe you do reinforcement learning, transfer learning, and reinforcement learning after that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you see. Um, so today I'm going to talk about natural language generation, in particular. So I will start with general introduction, <laughs> just to maybe uh, you're not familiar with natural language processing. That will be very quick, and then I talk about. Um, what we did actually uh, last month, so yeah, 
Let's just talk a little bit about Hugging Face, just to tell you who we are. So we are a Brooklyn-based startup. Actually, all the team uh, is in Brooklyn, uh, but me. I live in Amsterdam, <laughs> so that's why I have the pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, we have a very big team of eight people. So there are seven people in Brooklyn, and uh, I am uh, alone in Europe. Uh, we're doing a, a, an AI friend, which is like, a, it's a bit like a pet that, that would talk. So, uh, <laughs> but it's uh, made with artificial intelligence, of course. Um, so it's a, some, it's a conversational agent that you can talk to, but it's not intended to be goal-oriented. If you ask it to buy your train ticket, it will probably just make a bad joke about trains. So uh, it's more like a game. And it's designed to be a long-term uh, present something that could uh, that you could talk with for long term, so it get to know you and know what you like to talk about and know you, your family, kind of thing like that. It's mostly for teenagers, so they mostly talk about friends, school, uh, music, parents, and uh, all this kind of thing. Um, yeah, so today <coughs> I talk uh, about a science project we did. We do uh, <coughs> we do a lot of science. We get uh, a lot of like four publications last year. And this was a competition we participated last month, which was uh, at New Rips, and which was about uh, open domain dialogue. So let's just talk a bit about uh, natural language processing for those of you who are really beginner. So um, it's a pretty cool field. It's about processing and analyzing natural language data. How can we understand uh, the way human talk? And uh, how can we generate things that sounds like human talk? Well, look, because we're only talking about uh, characters, not about speech. That's another subject. So it's an uh, engineering field. Basically, it's like building planes. There are a lot of science fields uh, that are related to it. To it. Uh, cognitive science, concerned with the mind. Linguistics, what's language? That's the main question that these science fields try to answer. Computational linguistics, which is can we build computational models of language? So that's the closest, closest field by of um, closest to NLP. Machine learning is, uh, yeah, in general, can we build statistical models? And artificial intelligence is just a huge umbrella over everything. Now, even the reg regression equation is an AI equation, so uh, everything is there today. <coughs> and there are mainly two, two parts of it, which are uh, very often uh, present at the same time, which is uh, NLU. Can you understand text? So, for example, can you extract some information from text? So that's, that's super interesting. For example, uh, one thing I really like is uh, can you extract information from scientific publication, combine them together to like give some hints at new science discovery, possible new science discovery. For example, in cancer research, could you combine two publications and say, hey, this protein was also in this other publication. Maybe uh, it would be interesting to combine the two. I think that's a very interesting thing today. Like there are millions of uh, articles published every every year, just nobody can read them all. Um, so that's nat natural language understanding. It's the basis for pretty much all the systems that use text as input. And natural language generation is can you generate texts as uh, an output, uh, mostly to communicate with human beings, some dogs too, if you want to <laughs> make an AI that talks to your dog, and also to store some information as uh, human readable information. Like for example, summarization can also be used to store like summaries. Because basically, uh, pretty much all human knowledge is made of natural language. So it's like the way we store information. So that's very important to, uh, very interesting to know how to understand and generate that. So today, I mostly talk about natural language generation, uh, but we are interested in, in, in both. <coughs> and this is the last part of my short, small introduction. Just to share a few things I really like about uh, NLG. <coughs> uh, first, it's very interesting, like, in general, for example, um, to see the way we actually think, because there's, it's very, uh, like, uh, a huge part of the way we think is formulated as a language in our head, even though there is obviously a lot of other ways to think, but uh, there are some people who study language production as a way to do cognitive research. And I think uh, when we study language, we kind of feel close to human intelligence somehow. Uh, there is also a very interesting research on how language emerged and is acquired. So that's two things. Emerge is like, how did language appear in the human species versus 
animals. And uh, acquisition is how you learn language when you're like a kid. Like when you're three years old, how do you pick up some words? So these are very interesting thing. Uh, and the other thing, which is uh, more directly useful for the field of artificial intelligence, <coughs> is two, two big topics. Uh, one is debugging, because um, a lot of AI system today, they're, they're, they're starting to be used to make automatic decisions that impact the life of people. For example, can you, can you get a credit? Can your bank like, trust you? It's now an AI system, machine learning system, so we would like to understand why they made the decision they made. For example, uh, sorry, your, your CV was uh, taken out of the, of the automatic uh, recruitment system of Amazon. You want, to, you want to be able to explain how. <coughs> and one way is to do like we do for humans. We just ask them, like, why did you not consider this person for this job? And they explain, like, oh, like, I don't know what. You would like, well, because <laughs> we have all this kind of bias in our ML system. You've probably heard about that. Like, the, for example, the Amazon recruitment system kind of filtered women just because basically in the training data set there were less women. So this is the kind of bias we don't want to reproduce, and we want to know when our system are doing that. So one way is to empower a system with the language generation uh, ability. Blue's kind of crazy, but there are really, really people studying that and trying to do that. And the other is more uh, the topic of today is uh, <coughs> can we use all this corpus of language we already have to like help our uh, supervised system? So Alexandre talked about the cost of annotation. It's very expensive to annotate. Uh, in natural language, it's the same. Like you want to build a system that can uh, identify company names, you have to annotate all these names in newspaper, thing like that. That's very expensive. So can we use a uh, very big data set like Wikipedia in a way that would help our system to, to perform better on these small data sets? And one way we, we try to do that is basically by uh, learning how to generate language. So this is transfer learning. The idea here is that uh, if we know how to generate language, we basically have to learn a lot of interesting things in the meantime that will help us uh, on smaller data sets. And that's the, yeah, that's the general ecosystem around NLG. So I talk a lot about science. Uh, application, there are a lot of them. Machine translation is the most uh, promising one. I mean, the, there are already a lot of uh, systems that are in production. Summarization is very interesting, image captioning. <coughs> Business intelligence, can you automatically generate a report from some data, abstract data, summarize the data in a way that can be read by a CEO? that doesn't know how to use MATLAB or something like that to explore the data. Uh, entertainment is where we allocated uh, uh, games using natural language generation. <coughs> Customer support is also a very big area. HCI is basically everywhere. You have a human that tries to talk with a computer, which is uh, actually <laughs> present almost everywhere in our life today. You may want the computer to know how to understand language and to generate. And the art side is really cool too. Uh, we collaborate with some people who do like improvisation with a computer, uh, like playing, making comedy with the computer. Uh, so that's, that's cool too. If you want to talk about that, I like that too. Uh, <laughs> okay, so today, talk about uh, one natural language generation system. Um, so basically, it looks like this you have data, text, that input <coughs> in the system, and you generate something that looks like text. So. Let's look at uh, a real example. Today, the example I want to talk about is dialogue. Very long slide to read, so I let you <coughs> read it quietly. So um, yeah, dialogue is a prototypical application. Uh, you have a knowledge base usually, and you have a utterance from a user, <coughs> and you would like to reply in a way that makes some sense. So it basically it's a big umbrella over pretty much everything you would like to do with text. And in our talk, we, talk, we focus on, on the chit chat. So chit chat is a very short conversation. It's like uh, we call that small talk also in English, like just like yeah, this little talk. You don't go very deeply talking about family, but you won't ask too much questions. Or talking about movie, but like everybody is. Uh, 
slightly interested, but not too much. <coughs> so there are two main classes of models. Yeah, now we dive in the tech. Um, one way is to do a retri retrieval model. So a uh, retrieval model, uh, that look oldy, but it's still the <laughs> one of the most powerful models we have. You have a huge data set of possible answer, and you just try to get the best one. It's like exploring database. Uh, so of course, the, the, the good point is that the, the quality is usually really great because they're just written by humans. And if you have ver a very huge data set, uh, and you can actually get a very huge data set pretty, pretty cheaply, um, yeah, you all, all your answers are really, they sound great. The problem is that often you don't have the exact answer you would like to have, and then you're just screwed up. It's like, uh, so there are current research on how you could just slightly modify your answer. That's interesting, but yeah, it's difficult. And uh, consistency is difficult, uh, just because you, yeah, for the same reason. Like, you are talking about, I don't know, your dad in the database, your dad has a name. Then you talk about uh, uh, um, yeah, well, the dad example is a, is a dead end, but uh, <laughs> you get the idea. <laughs> you need to have all the answer in the same topic, and sometimes you have. And generative model, which is what I like, is the models that try to really build an answer, word by word. So they start the sentence, and so they're like, OK, what I'm going to say next as the next word. And definitely, uh, the good point is that you can adapt the answer, this uh, very uh, flexible uh, architecture. <coughs> but the, the problem is that uh, they have three main problems. They lack a consistent personality, mm. which means that uh, if you ask them their age, they will say, I'm 14. And then you ask again, they will say, when well, I'm 34. <laughs> and you're like, whatever, what are you? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, that's a big problem. They like a long-term memory also, because all the data sets we have are very short-term. Uh, they have usually mm -hmm. question-answer data sets, and so they are not trained to like uh, have a big history. And they tend to produce non-specific answers, I don't know. Uh, that's because they are trained using maximum likelihood, so they try to make the most uh, um, possible, like the with the answer with the highest probability. And like, <coughs> I don't know, works in pretty much all cases. Everybody asks you something, you can always say, I don't know. Well, if it's your name, it's a bit strange, but uh, it's a very safe answer, so they, they, they often fall back on this. And so the, the competition we were participating um, in December was at New Rips and was trying to tackle these this issues. So the idea here <coughs> was uh, first to build a better data set so uh, Facebook did this. Uh, they paired uh, <coughs> mechanical talkers together, and they gave them personality sentence. So each each person had uh, five sentences describing like a, a personality, <coughs> and they were asked to get to know each other, pretending they were their respective personality. So it resulted in a, in a pretty big data set, ten thousand dialogues, um, one hundred and sixty-four uh, thousand utterances. And a uh, pretty long dialogue, 14 turns. <coughs> so that was the data set. And uh, the competition was about building a bot that would act like one of these talker in the best way possible. OK. So that's pretty fun. That's pretty fun challenge, I think. Uh, the matrix, there were two kind of matrix to, to win. Uh, there were automatic matrix and human evaluation. <coughs> automatic matrix, there are three of them. I just go. Uh, over them because maybe you know, you're not familiar. Perplexity is a measure of uh, how, made, how, well, how well the model can predict the successive words in a gold answer message. So you feel the, you, you feed the model the beginning of an answer, and you ask, it, uh, you ask the model, what's the next word? And it has to rank quite high the next word that were used by the human. Okay, So this is a word by word matrix. You just sum all of this, and the, the, the best you do, uh, the lower you do, it's an exponential of uh, <coughs> of uh, entropy, so the, the lower you do is the better. Uh, hits at one, you give the model the gold answer, which which was uh, set by a human in the in the real dialogue, and you give him uh, eighteen or nineteen random answer sampled from the data set, and it has to retrieve the good one. Say okay, I, I think the, the human said this answer. Okay, and F one is uh, you ask the model to generate an answer, and then you count how many words that are similar to uh, what the human said. And human evaluation is um, they ask talkers to talk with uh, the models, and they ask them how much did you enjoy talking to this user, and uh, also which character do you think the other user was given for this conversation, uh, which try to see if the like the model was really used the, the personality was really using the personality. Okay. 
So these are the final leaderboard. Um, so we were first on the automatic metric uh, by a pretty big margin. Perplexity, we were half the best, uh, the second best. Pizza at one, we were also two times better in terms of accuracy. And the F1 was also, we were the first to go we were above 90. And uh, what's kind of interesting is that uh, <coughs> in the human evaluation, we were not the best. We were second after this, uh, this team lost in conversation. And so today, what I would like to do is to compare a bit uh, what the winner did. Because uh, what's very interesting is that the, the two approaches by us, uh, winner of the automatic matrix, and by the other team who won the, the human evaluation, were uh, very similar in many points but also different on some points. Uh, for example, we all build on top of generative transformer model. Both We both use transfer learning approach, and exactly we actually both use the same pre-trained transformer model on the same uh, data set. So that was very interesting. <laughs> uh, but there were also a lot of differences. Uh, how we did the second phase, architectural modification, we did that differently. We used different vector objective, different decoders. So you have two talks for one now, <laughs> we compare two. And now, which is kind of cool, we try to make a paper together, like trying to mix our models. So yeah, maybe you have another uh, meetup at some point. <laughs> uh, the common point. So these are like generative models. So they generate word one by one. And uh, in both approach, we use a generative model based on uh, what is called the OpenAI GPT. Uh, let's see if I have a, a description. Yeah. Uh, so I can maybe just show you a bit. If you does a lot of people know how transformer work or not? Uh, no, I guess. So. <laughs> if you know, you can just uh, look at your phone for some time. Uh, so I show you a bit because this is like the biggest revolution in NLP. Like everybody uses transformers today, but they are in a in a no class, <laughs> almost no class. I think the Stanford, the Stanford NLP course of this year has a transformer, uh, has a small part on transformer, but it's like nobody talk how they work. So I just walk you through them, okay? Uh, transformer, they, they take a, a sentence as input, the input is at the bottom. So here, <laughs> I stole this slide from uh, Emma Struber's talk. Uh, so it's like uh, more formal than the language we have. So this one is about normal committee. So uh, the input is the beginning of the sentence. And it says, Noble Committee awards treatment who advanced optic, and then it goes on, okay? So the first step is um, you put this black, this black box, which are uh, word embeddings. So I assume you know that, is that each word you assume a vector. And then you also have to put this brown box. Uh, this is because transformer, <coughs> as you will see, they are uh, perfectly symmetrical. They have no idea of, uh, they are made of dot products, and the dot product is symmetrical. U dot V is the same as V dot U. So you have to help them a little bit to say this word is before this one. Otherwise, they are all the, you could shovel all the world, and it would be the same for, for transformer, okay? So how you do that? You, you, get, you put uh, this brown thing, which are position embeddings, and uh, each, brown, each brown box at the bottom, just say, like, noble is the first word. So this is a position embedding for the first word. And all these, they are embeddings that are uh, learned, and that indicate the position of the world, okay? <coughs> so next, the first step is that, uh, <coughs> so you sum this black and brown thing, and this gives you a vector, and from this vector for each word, you, you build three vectors, which, which, which are the query Q, the key uh, in red, and the value in green. And then <coughs> for each word, you will make the dot product of its query, so the blue one, with all the red one of each of the other words, okay? And you get this, uh, this purple thing, which indicates how, how uh, similar does the query of, for example, let's say novel, look with all the other words. And you see that uh, uh, it looks very similar to the, to the key of optics for, the, for this first thing, and uh, a bit similar to the key of committee, for example. And if we take the last one, optics, it looks very similar to optics. Surprise, surprise. Uh, <coughs> but it's not always... Uh, I mean, here, for example, it's okay that nobody is is, uh, is white because you're making the product of the key with the, of the key on the query. So these are not the same vector, and you do that several times. You see, there are four uh, four purple um, vectors, uh, attention vector, because you have a several <coughs> heads, and basically each heads we have the the target to attend to some specificity. For example, the first head, <coughs> like the left one, 
might be a head that's sensitive to, I don't know, the, the adjective of a noun, okay? So it will make a, a huge attention to an adjective that, that would be related to a noun, okay? And like the, the third head, for example, would be more sensitive to uh, some, um, like the, for example, the verb that's related to a noun, okay? So you have all this, this view because obviously in a sentence, you have all the, all the words interact together and each word has a, re a specific relation to the other. So we try to model that with different <laughs> So you have this different self-attention thing that say how uh, interesting is each word in your sentence to uh, the word you consider. You do that in parallel for all the words. That's why you have all this all this verb thing. And then you make you make a weighted sum of the value <laughs> with where the weights are. This self-attention that you do. Okay. This look can can you, can you similar. This is like a database kind of approach. So you have several <laughs> vectors which summarize the, the updated value, and then you just uh, concatenate them, put them in the feed-forward uh, <coughs> part, which is where we have the nonlinearity. We always have to have a nonlinear network. And then you have uh, one layer. Then you do that 12 times, for example, in our case. And at the end, you have a vector associated to each, um, to each input word that basically has incorporated the, all the context for this word in one vector. Okay. And we train our model so that the last vector at the top is the next, is the next vector. So here, for example, <coughs> Nobel will be processed like this. And we train it so that this last vector is the same as the vector for committee. Okay, mm -hmm. the same for committee. The, at the end, the, the last vector after committee should be the same as the one. So, hmm. so this is the, the 12 time. I told you we do that 12 time. And at the end, oh yeah, get a good good slide actually. Noble is a project on committee. So this is uh, what we call language model. Ah oh yeah, just one just <coughs> one thing I, I have not shown because uh, there was too much on this slide. But um, each word it has to be uh, has to attend only to the previous word because it's very easy for Noble to predict committee if somewhere in the middle we mix Noble with committee because we're just giving it the answer. Okay. So what we do, we have a mask, which means that uh, when we do the self-attention for Strickland, for example, we only consider the left part. Uh, the same for each where they only consider the, the previous content. And this is called language modeling because we are modeling language, the probability of a sentence as uh, the probability of each word given the, the previous word. So here it will predict that significantly is the, the next word. So that's a language model transformer. Um, oh, sorry. Hmm. That was a, that's a bit fast, sorry. And uh, that's the model we use. Um, now we use that um, <coughs> through the transfer learning procedure. And I have to explain a bit why we have to use transfer learning. I told you personal chat is really cool because it's very big, uh, but actually it's very small. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> it's very big for a dialogue data set, but it's very small for an NLP data set. We have uh, one million words, but in a, in a good data set for deep learning model, we, we have usually one billion words. Like, the, for example, the billion word data set, which has a, a very explicit name, is a data set with one billion <laughs> words. And, um, in general, if you want to learn dialogue, you have to learn pretty much everything you need to do in NLP. You have to learn uh, coherence resolution, you have to learn name entity detection, some form of sentimental detection. Like if somebody say, my dad, my dad uh, died, you have to be sorry, like you have to understand somehow that this is a sad thing. And we want to learn all these things for this, from this uh, 10,000 dialogue uh, data set. And that's not enough, okay? So we have to use uh, a bigger data set. And you can see that on the, on the leaderboard. For example, I showed you at first because it, it's, quite, uh, it's a quite explicit way to see that. When you try to learn from a small data set, basically, you are either overfitting or underfitting. And here, you have the results on the, on the public uh, validation data set of the metrics I showed you. And this on the, on the right are the results on the, on the private test set. So the private test set, the only <coughs> the organizer in the competition have access to it. You send your model, they test it on the private test set, OK? But you cannot really know what's inside. <coughs> and when you, when you train a, uh, a big model on a small data set, 
Um, basically, your model will perform very well on, the, on what you have access to, the public data set, but then it will really perform poorly on NC data because it's really overfitting to all the peculiarities of your data. And the other option is to train a, a smaller model, which is not as good, but this smaller model will perform also middle, middle, uh, middle on, the, on the private testing. <coughs> and if you want to, to perform good on both, you need to have some way to extend your data set. So with transfer learning, so Alexandre explained, you first pre-train the model on a large data set, which is not the one you're really interested in, um, <coughs> but we, on which you hope to learn general concepts. And then you adapt the model on your small data set to make it perform well for your task. Uh, our pre-training, we use a very huge data set which is called the Toronto Book Corpus, which is 7,000 books. So one book is, is a lot of words, so 7,000 books are a lot of a lot of words. <laughs> and uh, we train it with language modeling. So basically the model learns to generate uh, books take word by word. So Toronto Book Corpus has a lot of actually uh, fantasy on romance books, so the model is a bit cheesy <laughs> to talk about <laughs> love, <laughs> but uh, it's okay. Uh, and uh, this provides the model with some kind of word knowledge. Uh, and also the ability to build coherent sentences because to predict well the word at the end of a sentence you have to be able to uh, uh, take into account language dependency. So in our experiments we started from one model which was pre-trained by uh, OpenAI and uh, the, the other team used the same. So let, let's look at the differences which are only in the adaptation phase. Uh, first one is uh, what data set you use for adaptating. Uh, we use a very small data set, we use a, which was a, actually a bad idea, but yeah, nobody told me that. Uh, we use a subset of, uh, even <laughs> we use even a subset of personal chat, uh, which is the one with, yeah, original personality, well, that's not super interesting, but yeah. Uh, the other team use a combination of two, two data sets with actually a full personal chat, so, so three times more uh, data. And then how do you adapt this, ar this architecture? Well, there is something you need to do because you have a model that know how to generate word by word, but now in the dialogue, it's not really the, the same thing, right? Because you have two speakers talking, you have to take that into account. For example, when I say I, it means you for you. Well, okay, that's maybe not very clear, but <laughs> you see what I mean? When I say you, it means I for you. Uh, so we have to take into account that words doesn't mean the same if they are pronounced by one speaker and the other, right? Uh, and we also have a knowledge base to incorporate somehow. We have this personality, we have to put them somewhere uh, in the model. So there are several ways to do that. The way we did that was to add uh, additional bases. So I told you, <coughs> we have this uh, input sentence. I told you we need to put positional normaling to tell the transformer model which word is first, which word is second. So we add another uh, kind of embeddings, which we call a dialogue state embedding which say like this word was uttered by speaker one, this word was uttered by speaker two. So this embeddings we know a representation of something being said by one person, something being said by the other person. So we have three dimension as uh, for input. And then if we have this kind of embedding, we can just uh, put all our input in a sequence. We, so we just conc concatenate everything. Here we put the, the personality, and then after that, we put the, all the history of the dialogue and then the last two terms that you're currently generating. So that's very easy actually to do as, a, as an input. And then we feed that in the model. We can play a little bit more with that. Um, because for example, you remember there were several personality sentences, but it doesn't really matter which one is first. If I say first I'm Mexican, and second I like cheetahs, or first I like to ski, and second I'm Mexican, it doesn't really matter. You, you don't really want to be sensitive <coughs> to the order of this thing. So uh, you can make complex architecture, or you can make something very simple. It's just like you repeat the same positioning information for each uh, input sentences, okay? So basically, this way the model just has no way to uh, differentiate the order of the input sentences. So that's, that's kind of cool. That's a way to actually process uh, a set, if you want, in math terms. And there are now what, what is called set transformers, which use the same idea. The other team took another approach. <coughs> they used the, the model to pre-train model two times. The first time to process the personality and the dialogue, 
And then the, from the output of this model, uh, they feed it again to process this time the, the previous output. This is based on uh, something called dual model. Uh, yeah. So if you're interested, we can talk about that. I think it's a pretty weird idea, but uh, yeah, they did that. So we'll see. It's a bit strange because um, <coughs> dual dual model is usually uh, it's an approach when you have. A, a symmetric task, for example, translating from French to English. There is a very clear sym symmetric task which is translated from English to French. And you know it's very easy, it's very interesting if you can share something between these two models. But in our case, it's not really clear there is a dual model. Like, can you translate a previous returns from the next one? Uh, uh, to me, it's a bit questionable. But yeah, that's how they did that. And the way they do that in the, in the transformer, for each word, <coughs> you do the attention of uh, the word with the with the with the previous one, as I described to you, but also you do also the attention of the word with the encoded persona and the dialogue, and you sum all of this. Now the training objective. Um, you have to help a bit the model to learn dialogue flow, and the way we did was that uh, we were feeding the models two kind of thing. <coughs> the first was the the dialogue with a good answer. And also the dialogue with a bad answer. So your model generates some hidden state. And then you take the last hidden state and you feed them to a classifier that try to guess if this was a good answer or a bad answer. So this way the model has to learn some kind of semantic view, like uh, more general, not at the token level, but like a, at the uterans level, trying to distinguish a full uterans from a bad uterans. And we use that uh, in combination with language modeling. Uh, the other team took another approach, also also multitask class, uh, also with a token <coughs> with a token uh, token level loss. So this this is LM. This is what I described to you, language modeling. The added this is which this thing is a is a soft LS. Is a <coughs> sorry sorry is a soft language modeling language modeling with label smoothing, and this is a risk class. Um, and this is very interesting. I think it's a very good idea. Uh, when you have a, a risk class, basically you, you let your model generate uh, some answer, and you try to rank the, the answer. And you you have a to, you try to train the, the model on some metrics that is not at the, the token level, but the full answer level. So they use the F1 metrics from the competition, which is maybe not the best one. But the good thing is that your model learns to generate full sentences and not only token. And that's very interesting. Of oh, that's very. Uh, that's a very good idea, I think. And the last thing is a beam search. Um, <coughs> just, uh, just a small word. Uh, your model knows how to generate word, and uh, it will tend to, to always get the, the best word. But sometimes you have, uh, for example, you start your sentence. There is one word which is not very often used, but it will lead you to uh, a continuation of the sentence that, that has a very high probability. Sometimes you have to be able to <coughs> take into account that some words are not very uh, have a low probability, but they lead you to a very good continuation. Okay, so to to do this, we use what is called beam search, and um, we were so good on the automatic metric that we used the, the most basic beam search that you can have, and I think that was a bad idea. Also, they use a better beam search with uh, a lot of uh, interesting things where it's all. Uh, uh, it's kind of, yeah, you see it's a published thing, but it's, it's quite uh, more uh, smart. So just to wrap up, if you're in the field, uh, what I think were a good idea on most questionable uh, thought. So I think the dialogue on medics were kind of cool, uh, <laughs> because they, they, they let us uh, make a lot of uh, concatenate different kind of input in one sequence. So now if you have seen there is a BERT model, which actually uses exactly the same idea. And also the next set of prediction loss, but we did that uh, we did that uh, before. I think. Um, and uh, good idea from loss in, in conversation was to use this um, risk loss, sometimes sequence level loss, mm -hmm. and a bigger a bigger adaptation data set. So we had, uh, I think, a strong exposure bias, which is when your model is only trained to predict word by word. It's, uh, it's not uh, it's not used to see its own input. And uh, yeah, another more questionable of choices, this dual model uh, scheme. Just to finish a little word about humans. Um, how did humans like our model? So this is our model <coughs> in action. And uh, it turns out our model asks a lot of questions. 
uh, almost every sentence. And it also turns out humans don't really like when you ask questions all the time. They are like gonna get bored. So uh, really the feedback from the user, so these are the turkeys that evaluated the models during the competition, was that really it asks too much questions. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very, uh, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's real when you like, when you look at the data set, for example, you look at the question word, uh, our models really like to ask a lot of who, what, when, where, why, how, so it's very, uh, <laughs> it's very <laughs> inquisitive. And the humans, the humans really uh, use a lot less questions. And question marks too. Uh, we are really the, we were the king in, in question marks uh, during the competition. <laughs> so this raises uh, one general question, which is uh, why is there such a gap between automatic and, uh, natural, uh, and uh, human evaluation? And so uh, this is a bit of advertisement because uh, with some friends from the uh, University of Washington, Microsoft stands for Facebook, we're organizing a workshop on this topic this summer. So if you are at NACO, uh, it's in Minneapolis. Uh, maybe not the best city, but uh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so today I'm talking here, and uh, the other guy in my research team is making a, a, a talk tomorrow in uh, Hawaii, in Honolulu. So I made some decisions. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I will be at, be at Minneapolis. Uh, and I don't think there is another conference in Hawaii, so you have no excuse, you, sh you should come. And the topic is uh, how can you make better, better, better model for language generation? And, uh, also, how can we better evaluate them? Why is there such a gap? Uh, so, well, there is a lot of answer on why there, there is such a gap, but uh, the question is how can we redu reduce the gap between automatic evaluation and uh, natural language, uh, and human evaluation, sorry. <coughs> and that's it for today. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas. We have time for maybe just a few questions, so that after... Uh, you can ask more uh, later. Mm. Yes. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, your architecture is very similar to BERT. I have a question. Do you think uh, using the masked um, language modeling gloss would be better than just mm -hmm. a simple uh, language modeling gloss? Yeah, it's a good question. So it's very, very similar. Also, uh, so the BERT model is exactly the same without the causal masking I was talking. And then if you don't use causal masking, you have to use some smart loss, uh, masked language modeling. And uh, so we've played a bit with BERT. Uh, I've played a lot with BERT, actually. And it turns out it's very bad for uh, natural language generation. <laughs> it's like, uh, because uh, well that's also a way they train it. They train it with always full sentences. So BERT think that it will always be fed full sentences. It has no idea there is a world outside, there is a world outside this sentence uh, that you feed it. So if you feed half sentences, it's like completely lost. It's like, why? Why is there no dot at the end? Why? Uh, so, and if you feed it just one word, it's like, what's this sentence? Uh, so, uh, that's bad. But um, if you follow a bit the field, there was a paper uh, two weeks ago <laughs> by uh, uh, Guillaume Lampre and, and Alexis Cono, uh, which are people from Facebook Paris. They do uh, uh, machine translation, and they use the um, same system as BERT for translation. And um, <coughs> the way they did that, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll just show you. Should I have asked a question because you see I'm already like uh, 20 minutes in my answer. Uh, one idea you could is to uh, replace this part, for example, by BERT. So uh, the persona and the dialogue, you know, they are always full sentences. They are like, yeah, they are full sentences. What is not a full sentence is the one you're currently building. So you can pre-train this part with masked language modeling, and then you just have to learn this part. So that's what they do in, the paper, in their paper, and it, and it works well. Yeah, it works well for translation. Uh, but translation is, I mean, it's a cool task in natural language generation, but um, normally all the content for the answer is in the input, right? You just want to translate. So uh, it's very important to understand the input very well. And once you've understand the input very well, it's quite more easy to, to generate. And for us, it's a bit different because uh, it's more like symmetrical. We have to generate something that is not uh, in, in our input. So I think this part maybe uh, training from scratch on the adaptation data set is not the best, but yeah. But you, you could do something like that. Yeah. And there are a lot of other things. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, word embeddings for um, uh, emojis that can appear in, uh, in the text? Uh, yeah, uh, but I don't think, uh, so we use a pre-trained model and I think there is no emoji. Uh, but we do use a lot of emoji in our work. <laughs> <laughs> so we can talk about emojis. 
Yeah, usually we use more Twitter data. They are great for uh, getting good analytics. Yeah. We have open source some stuff also. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question about how you have to do the free training step and uh, fine tuning to incorporate the notion of person. Because we don't have it like with it in the books from well, we did this thing. We just had a special embedding that say this is persona, um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. We <laughs> so so there are other ways you could pre-train. Um, so there is one paper on that, for example, from uh, Reddit. Uh, there are people like uh, you know Reddit probably, right? Uh, people uh, put a lot of comments. And if you read their comments, you can try to extract, try to build some persona sentences. So there was a paper by Pierre Emmanuel. They, they scrapped a lot of Reddit, tried to extract some persona sentences, and then try to predict the comments they made from this persona sentence. And it gave uh, some pretty good results on this data set. Uh, but they were not as good as our results, so I'm not sure it's very important. <laughs> but yeah. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Which. Um, I guess means I can basically take my sweet time, <laughs> uh, but I'll try not to uh, um, not to be too long anyway. Um, I hope that uh, you folks have you have had your share of learning and uh, training mo training models and uh, transfer learning, because I will not uh, speak at all about uh, training models or even about learning. Uh, as it turns out, I never touch the stuff. I barely know how you train uh, a model, but I'm, I'm I'm still doing something interesting. Um, <laughs> so, uh, let me introduce the talk by uh, uh, speaking a bit about what we are doing at SNPs first. Um, we are doing voice assistance, and we are doing a framework to build voice assistance. Actually, two frameworks, but uh, let's, let's say it's just one framework. Um, so, here are a few stats about, uh, I mean, yeah, you all, all heard the reports about CS a few weeks ago. Everybody is talking about voice assistants, uh, Siri, Google, or uh, obviously Alexa. <coughs> and um, the thing is, um, and even actually today, uh, there are every day or every week story about one of the big uh, companies. So, we need to add Facebook, obviously, to uh, Alexa, Google, and uh, Apple. Uh, that, uh, well, you will learn that uh, they are collecting data and without your knowledge most of the time, or they will uh, leak huge amount of data to hackers or whatever, uh, or to other company using the service. And um, so we think that um, it should be different, and we're trying to do things uh, differently. So uh, what we're doing is we try to run every single component of the voice assistant on a device at your home. Your voice should never leave your place. It should always stay uh, in <coughs> device that you own. And these devices, actually, uh, they should work even if they are not connected to the internet. Uh, so if we look at a voice assistant, <coughs> yeah, I had an animation here, but uh, it's no longer here. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so uh, a voice assistant is basically made of uh, a few components. One of them is the NLU <coughs> that uh, Thomas just introdu introduced to you. I mean, it's not the one he talked about, but he introduced it in his introduction, actually. Um, the, the place for, uh, for um, a speech generation or text generation would be more in the dialogue management, where you need to build uh, some kind of feedback to the user to get some uh, interaction by asking stuff that you need to complete uh, the user uh, query, the user request. But what I will be talking about today is the first component of the train is the wakeboard. Yes, okay, so here is my animation, I guess. Um, so the wakeboard is, uh, as it says, uh, the thing that will uh, allow the user to get uh, the attention of your assistant. So basically, it's OK Google, or Hey Siri, or uh, what else? Alexa, obviously, or Hey Snips. And, um, so this, uh, <coughs> well, I mean, this thing, we will run it on device. As everything we do, we, we want to run on device. We need to run a uh, wakeboard engine on device. And one example of a device that we are interested in is a Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, Raspberry Pi 3 is a single board computer. Um, I guess that most of you have seen, in, have seen one at some point. Uh, it's a great uh, little uh, toolkit to build a media player. Uh, or voice assistant, as it turned out. Um, but uh, Raspberry Pi 3, um, 
it's easy. It's actually quite uh, quite big. It has four cores um, and it has uh, like uh, yeah one gigabyte of RAM. I mean, it's it's it, it's a nice little computer. You can really do stuff with that actually. But uh, so we we try to get uh, to get something. We get to, we try to get one more challenge. And so come on now. Well, this was not planned. What? I don't think it's okay. Is it back? Yes. Okay. <coughs> like again. Okay, it's back. No, no technology too complicated for me. I guess. Anyway, so as I said, we try to uh, we try to uh, take the challenge a bit uh, further, and <coughs> yes, this time it worked. <laughs> and we add a satellite to the mix. So the idea is you will have a $35 Raspberry Pi 3 running uh, maybe in your living room somewhere and that will pe perform the entire uh, assistant uh, job. Um, but maybe uh, in another room, in the kitchen, um, if you really, um, I mean, if you really want that in your bedroom, you can have a satellite that will just listen for the wake word, and as soon as the conversation starts, we'll push the sound, not to the cloud, but uh, to a bit of cloud uh, in your living room, which is uh, the Raspberry, the Raspberry Pi 3, a bit more, uh, a bit more uh, strong computer. So a Pi Zero, um, it's a very tiny thing. I have one here. Um, that's the thing in the, uh, in the pink box. Uh, so it costs like uh, $5. And uh, it's um, it's still a computer, so it has <coughs> it can run Linux, 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 uh, and uh, uh, you can plug a screen on it, and basically do, uh, do everything that you can do with a Linux box. You can do uh, you can do on the Pi Zero. It will just be a bit slow, and you cannot do uh, too many things at the same time. You will just you will have <coughs> uh, just one core and uh, uh, half a gigabyte of uh, of memory. But it turns out that this is strong enough to run a record model. So uh, let's talk about voice because um, we've talked about, uh, we've heard about image, and from an outsider perspective, it looked like uh, it looks like image is yeah the first use case in uh, machine learning, and that most of people will actually work on image. We've, we've also have a talk about uh, natural language uh, generation. And uh, at SNPs, we work in voice. So um, when you need to, wo to work voice, at, uh, I mean, if you look from uh, 30,000 feet, um, it will look like an image, because you can actually transform uh, your input signal uh, in some kind of spectrum, which is not a spectrum, but it, uh, yeah, you can think of it as, as a spectrum. And then, well, you do the same thing again. You look for patterns, and you train a uh, model to, uh, to see patterns uh, in the data. So yeah, uh, basically, uh, spotting uh, hay snips somewhere uh, on a span of time here is not greatly different from spotting a kitten uh, in a picture. But the problem is, voice uh, and real-time voice, uh, it's an infinite uh, signal. Specifically for Outward, you will start the Outward engine, and it will listen all the time, waiting for you to maybe once a day, maybe twice a day, maybe a bit more, uh, say hey snips and start a conversation. So basically, uh, if you use a, a very basic um, uh, approach that say, okay, I will transform my signal in a two-dimension tensor, um, well, you will get an infinite tensor, or at least a very, very long one. Uh, yeah, so basically that is, we, we want to uh, actually, uh, you need to look at one, uh, one context, I mean a, a context, I mean a, a short amount of time, a short span of time inside this uh, data, and you cannot wait uh, to get uh, the end of the signal. So, so basically, uh, just, uh, I mean there are uh, no Greek literals in this talk, because I'm not a data scientist, I'm an engineer. Uh, I still use the infinite signal, so it's a symbol, but that's about it, uh, and it's not Greek, uh, so you don't like. Uh, so basically, if you look at uh, at an image sensor, uh, for instance, the input for uh, for inception that I guess uh, 
many of you folks will know better than I do. Uh, they use uh, little square images on three colors, I mean RGB uh, <laughs> components. Our uh, audio stream will most likely be an infinite uh, sequence of uh, 40, sometimes 20 uh, coefficients. And as I said before, well, we have to process that as soon as it produces. We cannot wait for the end to start uh, decoding and finding uh, the patterns. So uh, the first, uh, I mean, the most obvious approach is to try to do something end-to-end. Uh, -end. Um, there is another model uh, or another category of model that I will not uh, get into. So here, the idea is you basically uh, ask people to say, hey, snips uh, in the microphone. And uh, so you have your positive data set, and you get noise from all over the place. And that's your negative data set. And basically, that's enough to train a model uh, to uh, find out where, when hey, snips is said. If you want to know more stuff about training the model, because that's about the amount that I know, I will refer you to my uh, eminent colleagues over there, uh, which know everything about it. The problem with that is um, running a model um, on uh, one second, two second amount of time is uh, relatively expensive and will uh, definitely not fit on that. So uh, that's why there are these other approach where you actually find out some part of the world and then make a decision based on how many of these subparts you found. Okay, as I, I like, I know a bit about it. But anyway, uh, what we find out is that there, were, there was a, um, a, a category of networks that were uh, <coughs> developed by Google actually to do, uh, to do voice generation and uh, that we could some, somewhat um, hijack to do uh, voice detection and keyword spotting. <coughs> so uh, we've tried it. Uh, we, have, uh, we made a paper. We, are, we have a pending patent uh, on the use of this class of network uh, for this task. But basically the idea is that it's a huge stack of very small convolution. And the good point with convolution is that when you have run your first layer of convolution at one given place and that you just offset your window by a multiple of this of the window space, then the next dot will be just uh, will take the same value as before because it's invariant by translation. So the good thing is with that is you could actually stack the convolution and you can store the intermediate result because you know that they will be useful again at the next iteration, just uh, like 10 milliseconds later. <coughs> so basically, when we are streaming the WaveNet detector over our infin infinite uh, signal, then we just need to compute uh, this uh, green area of new values for, for the stack of convolution. We can reuse uh, the, the, this triangle, this yellow triangle of uh, previously computed uh, <coughs> intermediate results. And <coughs> we have just a tiny uh, bit of the network that is useful to take the decision at the given time. Okay, blue window, not that useful. So that's the theory. Uh, at this point, uh, you, can, uh, you can actually make an estimate of how many uh, well, basically, multiplication, you will need to uh, run these things and check that, okay, it sounds like it should work on a pi zero, uh, or even smaller, actually, but, um, well, um, then you need to put that into, uh, into effect. So there are a few obvious options. The first is, let's just, okay, let's hard code it. Um, we take, uh, we'll try to take a good language and efficient, uh, possibly not C or C++, and we will just write uh, the thing. The problem with that is um, it kind of puts things into, uh, yeah, into, uh, into stone. Uh, it gets very expensive to just make some alteration or some modification to your, uh, to your model. So basically, uh, the tech scientists guys, um, they don't like it. Uh, so and the option was to, um, to have TensorFlow uh, run the network anyway. Even if it doesn't like to do infinite stream, we could actually, um, I mean, 
taking some uh, weird thing where we actually use a part of an output signal for a layer and put that back into TensorFlow uh, at the next iteration. I mean, uh, it could have it could have worked. It would have been messy, but at least on paper, uh, it seems like um, it worked. But anyway, uh, the real thing is when we had to make that decision, uh, and that was uh, yeah maybe one year ago. Uh, we were already not using TensorFlow. Uh, 